Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. In each episode, members of ATA's Professional Development Committee will interview translation and interpreting specialists. They'll ask about what the work entails, what skills are needed, the pros and cons, and so much more. The goal is to showcase the variety of career paths in translation and interpreting and help working professionals and students understand what's out there, how they can get started, and what they need to succeed. Specialization is arguably the best way to strengthen your translation and interpreting business and stand out from the crowd. We're hoping to bring you one episode a month, and we hope you'll join us on this informative journey. This podcast is brought to you by the American Translators Association. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information at the end of the show. All right, now over to the PD Committee and this edition of Inside Specialization. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the ATA Podcast Specialization Series, a special collaboration between the ATA Podcast and ATA's Professional Development Program. I'm Adam Sachs and I am a member of ATA's Professional Development Committee. Today, we are really excited to bring you this episode where we will hear about audiovisual translation from someone who has a PhD in translation. Joining me today is our special guest, Angelica Ramirez, who will tell us about her journey in these areas. Angelica Ramirez holds a PhD in transla translation from Alicante University. Her professional experience, which spans 30 years, includes the translation of books, research papers, web pages, promotional videos, films, documentaries, and miniseries. She currently subtitles educational, cultural, and corporate videos, in addition to being a professor for several postgraduate programs in Mexico. She is a member of the American Translators Association, the Organización Mexicana de Traductores, OMT, and the Asociación Mexicana de Traductores Literarios, A-M-E-T-L-I. So, Angelica, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, can you describe your background to us and tell us what prompted you to seek out a PhD in translation? I am I'm very happy to be here with you. Well, I started as a translator 30 years ago, 30 years and back then, there weren't uh, too many choices to study postgraduate programs in Mexico. And even if I had already been translating since uh, the early 90s, uh, by the year 2000, I felt that I, I needed to, to learn more. So I, I started to find out about uh, international uh, translation programs, and I found that Spain had uh, several postgraduate programs, and I decided to to apply for a scholarship, got it, and then I left for Spain, and that's that's when everything started. How exciting! And what are some ways that your formal education in Spain and and the research that you've done have helped you and opened doors for you? Well, I think that I I started to be more aware of what translating uh, really is, like how how deep your uh, decisions as a translator sh should be, more than a uh, sending the final project like uh, fast in a short time. It's more than that. It's of course there are clients who need your your job to be fast but uh, i i really uh, felt that i had to to think more about my own uh, translating decisions like when facing translation problems your client won't tell you what to do or how to solve them so i i think that my my professional uh, work has improved because I am more aware of uh, translation. Uh, I don't want, like the word limits, but problems. And uh, I, before that, before the PhD, 
I solved many issues, uh, let's say by intuition, yeah? like, well, I might, let's say, should I address the viewers uh, as a single viewer to, or usted in a formal way, or ustedes, plural form? And well, if nobody was there to tell me, but then, uh, of course, after years of experience, I have learned that every program or every text uh, in some way tells you if the, the author or the narrator wants to be like in a short uh, distance with the viewer or reader, and you can uh, find those little uh, signals there in the text. You should be a, a, a good observer and then you can make decisions. So that's what I learned in the PhD. Besides more things, of course, I learned about translation theories that helped me explain uh, different approaches to translation. So I think that my, my everyday work has improved because of my PhD. And you mentioned that when you <clears throat> decided to pursue the PhD at Alicante, that at that point you had been translating for about 10 years. So at that point, had you developed uh, your area of specialization, which is audiovisual translation, or were you kind of working in multiple areas? And then once you got to the PhD program, did you kind of pursue that, pursue a concentration within your current area of specialization or kind of what has, uh, tell us a little bit more about your path toward like within and toward audiovisual translation and how that um, was or was not part of your, uh, your PhD as well. Uh, curious to hear more about that. Well, uh, when I finished my BA, uh, I started as a legal translator, but I realized that was not for me. I was there for three months, <laughs> and then uh, I, I wasn't happy there. So the second job I had was as a, a proofreader uh, of subtitles. And of course, I didn't know anything about subtitling except that I loved subtitled movies, movies. But well, I applied for the job and my boss, of course he noticed I was not an expert in subtitling at all, but he, he saw that I was young and enthusiastic and I really wanted to learn. And what really helped me to, to get that job was that not only I, I loved movies, but I, I was always curious and I was always wanting to learn about grammar and spelling and, you know, uh, people who are not translator, translators or linguists are not really fond of that. So once he no. said that I wasn't, yeah, I was not afraid of dictionaries, he said, yeah, she's the one. And that's how I, I got the job. And I have to tell you that the moment I started uh, working with uh, TV series and films, I just fell in love with this uh, modality of translation, and I, I developed uh, developed a real passion for subtitling, dubbing, and voiceover, which are the sub modalities I I have worked on. So that's where where it all started. And when I went to Spain, I I thought that I would I I wanted to open like my uh, working horizon and say, I might uh, do something else besides audiovisual translation. And I really loved what I learned about uh, literary translation and all the courses I took were really interesting. But then I, I came back and the first job I had uh, was translating texts and that was really fine. Uh, but I had, all, again, the opportunity to, to go back to the visual translation. And then it, it, I just felt it in the heart and say, this is what I love. So let's go back to it. But with a different view, as I told you, I, I became more aware of what I was doing and what 
needed to be done for the viewer's sake. So yeah, I I, I went back to the visual translation. That's great. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, it, it comes, this kind of uh, starts to get into a topic uh, that I think comes up relatively often within um, the broader translation community, uh, which is both, uh, you know, you have a PhD, I'm nearly complete with a, with a master's degree in translation. And I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, the, the topic of the value of pursuing a terminal degree in translation. What are some of your thoughts on that? And, uh, you know, the, the pros and cons and, and why, um, you, why you think it's important, why it has been important to you. Um, and maybe expound a little bit more on what you had already said about, uh, some of the reason, what learning, why you do certain things. Well, I think that, uh, of course, it's not a, an easy decision, right? Because <laughs> you may know, it's a, a postgraduate program takes a lot of your time and your yeah. energy. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I mean, I, I'm. I've been almost done for almost a year now, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you're doing the. You know, we we do it uh, out of a certain passion as well. Exactly, that's the point, and I'm glad you mentioned it. You must have this. Uh, deep interest or passion about learning and uh, researching. Otherwise, uh, this is not for you. And I have to be honest, uh, you have to, to love books and, and theory and always be eager to learn something more. And because you are constantly learning when you are pursuing a master's or a PhD program, uh, you have to be there. You you become a student again. So if you uh, have already forgotten about that, about uh, submitting projects and delivering uh, homeworks, uh, it might not be for you. And I have to be really honest because this takes a long time and. Uh, you need to to devote your energy and efforts in order to to get your de degree. So if you're that kind of person, the person who is like an eternal student, this is for you. Uh, and I also have to say that there are people who don't have any problem in learning things by themselves, like they are self-taught people. And there are other people like me who need uh, a mentor, who need somebody to, like to me. <laughs> show me yeah. and you. <laughs> That's maybe a reason why we go back to university after yeah. finishing our BA. I, I think so. We need somebody to tell us, okay, you should learn more about uh, this area or have you heard about this other subject? Uh, that's what I, 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 I needed. So let's say before uh, going to Spain, well, and I, I will uh, make a little parenthesis here. Things have changed so much with technology. When I started my PhD, it was the early 2000s, 2002 to be precise. So back then uh, there weren't social media as there are today. And you couldn't get, uh, let's say, uh, articles, PDFs, as easily as you get them now. You know? So that was another reason why I, I decided to, to study this a PhD, because information was not so handy as it is now. So that's something I, I have to say. But apart from that, uh, as I was saying, if you are this kind of person who are interested, uh, who's interested in learning things by yourself and feel comfortable with that, you might not 
need to pursue uh, a postgraduate program. But if you are like like me, as I said, who needs a teacher to tell you what's new in the area, what's like uh, that, that there are so many translating translation issues that you should consider before uh, delivering a, a project. If you're that kind of person, then I think you you need you don't need, but it's always good to to continue studying. I I really think so. Otherwise, I wouldn't have learned so much about translation theory. And in those times, uh, CAT tools were already starting, so I wouldn't have learned about that if it were weren't for the PhD. So in in some way, a uh, it helps you keep updated. And if you don't do it by yourself, I think that a postgraduate program helps you to, to learn more about what is uh, getting done, what is being researched. That's what I think. Yeah, I I appreciate that you're kind of um, emphasizing the importance of understanding one's own learning style. Is that, uh, you know, do you thrive in a, a formal educational environment or do you um does that kind of get in the way of your development as a translator and i think uh you know it seems to um both you and i are uh in the former group um and it's interesting you hearing you talk about how technology has changed and how you pursued your phd in part to kind of understand what was out there and interestingly that the flip side is true now where I'm writing my thesis and I am taking advantage of uh, being near the New York Public Library, but I would probably be camped out there if uh, if I didn't have access to so many um, dissertations and articles and pieces that are just available online. And that's the case with many of the classes that I've taken. So it's, it's very interesting to hear your perspective um, in that regard. For others considering a formal education in translating or interpreting, uh, what are some things to keep in mind when looking at various MA or PhD programs around the world? Like not only just, uh, you know, how how you do in a formal environment, but um, if I'm I or someone else were looking for a program such as this, what are some things that um, from your perspective, uh, some things to look for? in terms of um, what makes a program worth, like uh, a good program worth uh, worth pursuing? Well, in that regard, things have also changed a lot because you have a variety of programs now that cover different modalities of translation. Let's say that you can pursue a master's program on audiovisual translation per se, and they are not as general as they were before. So I think that if people are interested in pursuing a postgraduate program, it would be good to, to find out about the subjects, what kind of courses uh, universities offer, and what about the professors? Uh, are they researchers? Are they you know, active in translating? Because sometimes they are academics, and that's really good. They are scholars who produce uh, articles and research papers. But if you're interested in, in meeting someone who is an active translator, then uh, find out about that. It, it all uh, depends on what you're looking for. Like, let's say, if I were to, to pursue another a program, another postgraduate program, uh, I would like to focus on certain uh, areas like accessibility, mm -hmm. like subtitling for the deaf, uh, hard of hearing or mm -hmm. uh, audio description. So uh, I now I know I should focus on that. So that's something important to find out about the courses you would take and the the background of your professors and because i said there are many programs which are like very general 
where you can learn about legal, economic, uh, literary translation. But you might also find something that is more uh, interesting to you or that has to do more with your uh, personal experience. So I would uh, suggest that find out about your the courses, what they offer, because there's a, a nice variety of programs nowadays. And the fact that you don't have to travel and live there for five or six years, that makes a huge difference. You can take uh, online courses and that's great. Yeah, a lot more of these programs, uh, the one that I'm doing included, are are leveraging uh, the technology that allows us to to pursue these uh, these degrees remotely. Um, so, what are some challenges that you've faced along the way of your uh, of your thirty years? Uh, you know, gaining a PhD and uh, and working in audio visual translation. Um, can you tell us about some of those? Yeah, something that you wouldn't believe is that when I finished and and got my PhD, I came back to Mexico, and for many agencies, I was overqualified. So I wouldn't. No, I I could believe job. that. I I could believe that. Sorry to <laughs> interject there, but yeah, really? Unfo unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, so it was shocking because I I was sure that uh, once I, I came back to Mexico, everything would be so smooth and all everybody would love to work with, with me. Not at all. I spent around five or six months uh, looking for a job because uh, that's why people said you are overqualified and no, no, that's not the the professional background we, we need for our translators. Like, what you know is too much for what we do. So that was really disappointing. And I mentioned this because it might happen to, to more people, right? Nowadays, you know, uh, there are many, many, many people who perform as translators. And, uh, well, they, they might have a good clients, and they they went a different way, like from me. Like they started and they became, let's say, good at what they do without having formal education. So that kind of of agency or translation office would say this kind of person is enough. I don't need a person who has such a huge education in translation. So this is important. This is important to know because uh, I, I don't want to, to say false things and create false expectations on people. But the good thing is that there are always uh, agencies that really uh, appreciate and value your education. So they have different projects that need to be uh, how could I say more uh, when you don't have you can't even use automatic translation when you have to think about the right words the right register how to avoid uh, political issues like how to be politically correct all the time there are a uh, Texts like, like that, that need to be consciously uh, translated. I don't mean that you are unconscious when you translate other kind of stuff, but there are special texts that really need you as a translator to, to ponder upon what you are saying and to whom you are translating for. So that kind of agency wants a person who who has studied more and has a more formal education. So there are, as always, a different clients for different translators. And I could say uh, that once I, I met this kind of people, like my uh, former bosses, they said, ah, you are back. Okay, we were not waiting for me. That was really nice to say, but 
uh, but they they wanted a person uh, like me, you know, so who who really values the translation process and and takes uh, their time to make the right decisions and try to produce the same effect on the viewer or the ta target language than the same they had that had the original viewer. So this kind of person was uh, was what uh, these agencies wanted. So yeah, there are people who who really appreciate your formal education, but it's not easy, and it's not a this, let's say the majority of clients are not like that, and I have to be honest about that because I don't want people to think that once I have my PhD, the world will open its doors for me. That won't happen, but there will be there will be certain doors which will be really interesting to to open and will be good clients and you will have really interesting um, projects. I don't know if I answered your question. No, I think you did, and I think what you're uh, you're speaking to a universal uh, issue that all of us as translators have to have to face, which is being persistent in in trying to find the right clients for you and your background and who will like appreciate what you bring to the table. And that, uh, that having a PhD or a master's degree or anything is no guarantee that you get a pass on that, uh, on that challenge on, on just, you know, maintaining the persistence and, and finding the right clients. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's important. Um, coming back to, uh, your area areas of specialization. Um, we had mostly talked about audiovisual translation, but you did mention that in the PhD program, you got a little bit more into literary translation. And we mentioned in your bio that you're a member of uh, AMETLI. Um, what are some skills that you've developed that feel unique to your areas of specialization? And how have you, um, are, are there ways that you've managed to apply them uh, in the work that you've done? Uh, well, I think that um, being more aware of language varieties uh, and uh, let's say the, the use of a uh, register, that has helped me have a, a different approach to translating. Like I said, I I might want my narrator to to feel uh, close to the, the reader. So now I know there, uh, how to do that. Or, you know, something as, as simple as keeping that conversa conversational tone, like uh, making characters speak everyday language mm -hmm. and without any tone or any hint of being a translation. You might say, but every translation should be like that. I can tell you that, uh, let's say, in subtitling, you you keep the original track, the original audio track. So it's really common for the translator to translate word per word. And that's when the viewer says, that sounds artificial. That's not Spanish. And there's a reason for that, because it's really easy to, as I said, to translate word for word because you are listening to the original film. Uh, but once uh, you know how to do things, uh, you that's something I, I have learned. You analyze your characters, like the personality of your characters. You want your characters in Spanish to speak the same way as in the foreign language. So I think that I, I I am better at that than before uh, because I I can uh, identify uh, those um, I don't know uh, marks not only in the tone but the the use of words that tell me how the character is more or less it, for literary text as well as for uh, films and TV programs. So I think that I'm uh, 
I have uh, developed uh, that skill to keep more the conversational tone, to be more uh, faithful to the character's personality, the character's traits, because I, I have learned more about that. And the problem here is that since in for subtitling, let's say, you know that the best subtitle is the one that conveys the same information as the original original language in the a very concise form. Yeah. Do you know mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. So I I learned not to to add uh, unnecessary words and I go straight to the point. But <laughs> the, I have been so uh, used to this that even my own emails are like that. Like short sense, short sense. <laughs> Very straight to the point. Uh, well, in that sense, it's not skill anymore. It sounds like a little bit cold in some way, but that's something that when you're translating and mainly when you are a subtitler, you need to develop to write in a, a concise way, precise way, like the same information in the shortest way possible. So that's something that not a, any subtitler can do because they are afraid of, uh, summarizing, or, and they always say, but people will feel that it's not the same information. And as I always say, you need to rephrase the original message and convey it in a short way. So I think that I have developed that skill. It's not so, uh, so easy, mainly for younger translators, but you learn how to do it and you go just straight to the point. So yeah, as I said, keeping more a uh, more conversational natural tone. That's also I have developed, and um, yeah, the I think the this uh, skill to to read more about characters, uh, not only in their actions but in their their words, the way they express themselves. Uh, I think so. Very interesting. Um, so one last question. Uh... Can you tell us about any noteworthy or interesting projects you have done in uh, in your area of specialization? Well, uh, I have like my favorite one and I translated that in the year 2000. <laughs> so uh, I should have more than that, but it, maybe it was the that stage of my life when I was, I had been translating for almost 10 years, but still, uh, I was a young translator, and it was uh, uh, a miniseries for children, which was called The Worst Witch, and it was from Canada, I guess, and it was really nice, not only because it was a very well done, a, in nice settings, in the woods, the, the, it was a school for witches, so you can imagine a castle and all that, uh, uh, let's say, context for uh, students of witchcraft. Of course, this was before Harry Potter. So it was something new and nice. But for me as a translator, it meant a real challenge because uh, there were some humorous scenes for Girl said puns, and you had a, an image, certain image. Let's say they were uh, practicing some spell and something went wrong. So you had a, a pig instead of a frog. But the thing here was that if I ha was a translator for dubbing. So I had to, to convey the same information, but also to make it funny and make the the Spanish words and match the movement of the lips of the characters in English, right? And besides, uh, you can just uh, create any uh, joke or pun without taking into account where people are watching on the screen. So making all these three things match, uh, the information, the lip synchronization, and the image was really tough. 
and almost every episode had jokes, puns, and, and funny things. So it was uh, a constant challenge to to deliver that uh, that that kind of translation for children, and in a funny way and in still interesting way. It was a really nice TV series, and it was one of my favorite ones because. Uh, it was a constant, constant challenge. So that's one that I can think of right now. But of course, there have been uh, many like films uh, back then. I think it was the late nineties. I translated Dracula, you wow. know, Bram Stoker's, <laughs> and it was one of my favorite films. So I also. Uh, I think that's one of my favorite. This is a challenge, but because it was a really a uh, nice movie for me, and the last thing I I translated was a a book, a mystery novel, and well, it it was also a a challenge because it's uh, the concept context is. Uh, Bolivia in this uh, 17th century. So the author asked me not to use modern words. So the, the thing was not to make it uh, a clumsy narration that felt awkward to the reader, but still to keep that uh, sense of ancient times. And that was really tough. But it was... I. I I fell in love with that uh, novel, and uh, well, I, I I was was really happy, although it was really tough. So those are some projects I can think about now, but of course there are many more. Great. Well, thank you very much, Angelica. That's those are all the questions I have, and um, we've uh, spent a good deal of time uh, hearing some very interesting uh, insights from you about your journey. Um, so uh, really appreciate you coming on here. Oh, thank you for the invitation. And I hope that people make their minds and pursue a PhD or a master's program. If they really feel like they will, they will see translation in such a different way that it's worth it trying, really. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Adam. You've been listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. Big thanks to everyone involved in the production of this episode. ATA's PD committee developed and coordinated the interview. Mixing and editing was done by Derek Platts. ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. Now, if you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's somebody out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about us. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. I can honestly say that ATA launched my freelance career and I've never looked back. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make a difference. And ATA isn't just for translators or interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can become members. We have teachers, professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. Go to ATA's website, atanet.org, for details. Or check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.